It was September 2nd, 1859. People all over Europe and North America woke up at night, confused and still tired. They were sure it was already morning. It was so bright outside. But when they looked out of their windows, they discovered it wasn't sunlight. The skies were lit by countless intense auroras, red, green, and purple. They were so brilliant, one could read a book as easily as in the afternoon. Auroras appeared even in the regions where they had never been witnessed before, like Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Hawaii. Cool visual effects weren't the only thing that both mesmerized and horrified people. The most high-tech stuff at that time, telegraph wires, shorted out throughout Europe and the US. Sparks were flying from equipment, and many human operators got electric shocks. Papers and telegraph offices burst into flames. All the machines were immediately disconnected from their batteries, and still, they mysteriously kept sending broken messages. Fires, ignited by short circuits, spread over large areas. Colorful lights kept dancing overhead. All this caused panic and total confusion. Earth's inhabitants had never seen or experienced anything like that before. At that time, very few people knew that the sun was to blame for the chaos. One of them was English astronomer Richard Carrington. At about 11 a.m. on September 1st, the man was standing by a telescope in his private observatory. He was watching sunspots on the surface of the sun. Suddenly, two patches of intense white light broke out. They looked as bright as direct sunlight. At that moment, the astronomer didn't know what a terrible commotion these flares would cause. Later, it became clear that the sun had produced an epic geomagnetic storm and unleashed it at our planet's protective layer. Wave after wave of charged particles slammed into Earth's atmosphere. The planet's magnetic field wasn't powerful enough to stop them. It gave way, and the storm hit Earth, causing havoc. The phenomenon got the name of the Carrington event. So far, it's been the worst solar storm ever recorded. Good thing it happened when people didn't have advanced technologies and weren't that vulnerable to the sun's geomagnetic fury. The 1859 solar storm was three times more powerful than the one that happened on March 13, 1989. Three days before it began, astronomers watched a massive eruption on the sun's surface. Within a couple of minutes, a billion-ton cloud of gas was hurled away from the star. It rushed straight toward our planet at a speed of millions of miles per hour. On Monday the 12th, the huge mass of solar plasma reached Earth's magnetic field. This storm was so fierce, it lit spectacular auroras and created underground electric currents beneath North America. These currents must have found some weaknesses in the power grid of Quebec, Canada. In less than three minutes, the entire city lost power. Millions of people found themselves in pitch black streets, dark buildings, and stuck elevators. They woke up in freezing cold homes, unable to cook breakfast. The following 12-hour blackout closed businesses, airports, and schools. The Montreal Metro was also shut. In the US, hundreds of power grids started to have problems minutes after the storm hit Earth's surface. Luckily, none of these issues led to a blackout. The storm was severe enough to disrupt satellite communication systems and radio signals. Some space satellites tumbled out of control for a few hours. Lots of them had mysterious problems that went away as soon as the storm began to subside. No newspaper mentioned it, but in 2012, Earth had a close shave after narrowly missing an extreme solar storm, the most intense in the past 150 years. On July 23rd, Astronomers at Space Weather Prediction Center in Colorado spotted two clouds of energetic particles. They erupted from the sun's surface and barreled into space. Just 19 hours later, these clouds zoomed past the spot our planet had just left. If the solar eruption had happened several days earlier, Earth would have ended up in the line of fire. So, what if a solar storm as powerful as the iconic Carrington event happened nowadays? How much more harm would it cause? 
Would our life get back on track after such a disaster? Before you learn the answers to these questions, let's figure out what a solar storm is. The sun is a gigantic, constantly changing ball of molten gases. Every once in a while, it spews out bursts of energy, solar flares. They often go hand in hand with something called coronal mass ejections. Those are giant bubbles of ionized gas that can speed up to more than 600 miles per second. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison with solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot, with the temperatures reaching several million degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. The star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. Scientists classify solar flares depending on how brightly they shine in X-rays. You aren't likely to notice the tiniest flares if you don't have special equipment. Medium solar flares lead to fleeting radio blackouts at the poles, but nothing too serious. It's X-class flares people should worry about. They cause the strongest and longest lasting solar storms. When people think about danger coming from space, most of them imagine an approaching asteroid, like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. But apparently, we should be much more worried about our good old sun. A super strong solar storm heading toward Earth won't happen at once. First, there will be high energy sunlight, mostly ultraviolet rays and X-rays. They will ionize our planet's upper atmosphere and mess up radio communication. After that, a radiation storm will hit Earth. And finally, several days later, a colossal cloud of charged solar particles will reach our atmosphere. The particles will interact with the planet's magnetic field and wreak havoc all over the world. If an intense solar storm happened these days, it would start by disrupting GPS and knocking out satellites. If any astronauts were spacewalking at that moment, they would have a mere minutes after the first flash of light to find shelter. Their spacecraft would likely be properly shielded and safe enough. The main challenge would be to get inside in time. After that, the storm will proceed to interfere with satellite communications. That's why tons of your daily activities, from calling your friends to paying with your credit card, would be at risk. But one of the worst consequences would be connected with power grids. Power surges caused by the particles coming from the sun would damage giant transformers. Those take ages to replace, especially if hundreds or even thousands get wrecked. In some places, a failure of one power grid would make others collapse as well, creating a domino-like reaction. Picture living without electricity for a day, a month, a year. No light, no computers, no phones, water supply systems out of order, no food in supermarkets. Plus, without electricity, it would be next to impossible to reboot the already failed power grids. A powerful solar storm would cost people one trillion to two trillion dollars, and that's just during the first year after it happens. It would take the world another four to 10 years to recover. The damage to all kinds of satellites alone would reach $70 billion. Under majestic auroras, people would have to get used to a new, dramatically different lifestyle. No doubt, we'd have some kind of warning. Modern equipment all over the world and in space doesn't stop watching the sun even for a second. Once a bad solar storm happens, people would have some time to prepare, between several hours and a couple of days. And if transformers are taken offline in time, the consequences won't be so dramatic. Now, the following news might sound scary. There are also super flares. In comparison to them, our sun's burst of radiation are small potatoes. Super flares mostly occur in young and active stars. In 2016, astronomers saw such a phenomenon. A star 1,500 light-years away from Earth produced a flare 
that was 10 billion times more powerful than any of those that burst from our sun. It doesn't mean we're safe here on Earth. Even our middle-aged sun knows how to produce super flares. But while young stars can have them once a week, or even more often, for the sun, it's once in a few thousand years. And still, if people don't figure out how to protect the planet, just one super flare can shred our ozone layer and wipe out life on Earth. Is it possible for a planet to have not one, not two, but many suns? Let's imagine what would happen to us if the sun suddenly decided to break into a bunch of small stars. During the search for Earth-like planets throughout the universe, scientists have discovered that systems of two or even three stars are not actually that rare. Many of them even have planets in their habitable zones. Almost half of these planets could contain life. Can't wait to ask these guys about the sunsets. Scientists even suggest that our sun wasn't always lonely. It could have had a companion star called Nemesis. They've noticed that mass extinctions on Earth occur every 27 million years. It's like a cycle. So they turned to the stars to find out what the reason might be. And then they assumed that it was a star that left our sun a long time ago. But it still affects us. Nemesis could be located about 1.5 light years from us. It may not sound like a lot, but it's actually almost 9 trillion miles. That's going to be a fun car trip, 50 million years long. Anyway, every time Nemesis passes its orbit, it can affect the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is an area surrounding our solar system in which comets are formed. Its existence hasn't yet been proven, but scientists are pretty sure about it. So, comets form inside this cloud and then relocate to our solar system. Even being very far away, the second star in the system can have a great influence on it. But what about systems with four or even more stars? Is it even possible? Actually, yeah. But the more celestial bodies you add to the system, the more difficult it becomes. The orbits grow unstable. It's going to be as chaotic as can be. In stellar mechanics, it's called the three-body problem. It says that it's very difficult to predict the orbits of bodies in such systems. In most cases, they turn out to be very random and unique. Isaac Newton was the first to have noticed it. He tried to apply his gravitational discoveries to the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. He found himself with quite a struggle. It wasn't easy to understand how three stellar objects orbit so stably around each other. And that's just a planet and a satellite. How about including several stars? I wouldn't envy those who will have to calculate all this. Oh, right, it's me. Anyway, we know that triple star systems are ridiculously chaotic. But what about systems with more stars? They're very, very rare. In 2021, NASA discovered a star system of as many as six stars. That's just crazy. Of course, there are no planets in it, but who knows? Maybe one day we'll find such a system, too. In such worlds, the gravity dance is very complex. It takes very specific conditions to hold everything together. It's like walking on a tightrope over an abyss. With all this in mind, let's try to imagine what would happen if the sun suddenly turned into several small stars. <laughs> oh, we're going to need a very detailed simulation. No, probably even a dozen simulations to make this thing work. Because otherwise, we'd only have a few options. Option 1. We divide the sun into 5 to 10 tiny suns. Now we'll scatter these guys not far from each other. They'll destroy our system in a couple of hours. Yeah. All star systems, including ours, are in constant motion across the universe. So they'll crash into each other almost immediately. This collision will lead to the creation of a supernova. Our system will turn into a beautiful, colorful nebula. For us, it will happen in just a couple of minutes. We won't even have time to feel anything. And all the planets in the X solar system will immediately turn into sparkling space dust. Um, but it's not the best option for us, right? Let's see if it can go any other way. Option two, 
Since they can't be located so close to each other, let's try to set them as far away as possible. And in this case, they'll just leave. Bye bye Their gravitational force is too weak to hold everything together. The little suns will simply leave the solar system, flying into space in random directions. After that, the rest of the planets will descend from their orbits, including poor little us, of course. We'll become a so-called rogue planet. At first, we won't even realize that the planet has gone out of orbit, and we won't have time to do anything before it gets incredibly cold. What a sad and poetic end. In general, none of these outcomes sounds very fun. Oh, all right, we still have the last option. Our main problem is that we make each of these little stars the same mass. But just take a look at all these multi-star systems that we've already discovered. You'll see that none of them look like a bunch of glowing balls together. Instead, there are a couple of large stars there, and the rest, the small ones, are orbiting around them. So how about two large stars and two small ones? What will the Earth look like then? Well, its orbit will become terribly unstable. We'll shake back and forth. Wouldn't recommend it, honestly. We know what this can lead to because, and that's just crazy, this has already happened to us once. Yes, about 70,000 years ago, a lone star visited our solar system. It was a red dwarf called Scholz. A red dwarf is a very small and cold star. If you count 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit as cold, of course, but it's considered the weakest and coldest type of star, so it probably didn't look that big and bright in the sky. At that time, our ancestors, Homo sapiens, were already there living their lives. And can you imagine? They saw another star in the sky approaching the sun. I wonder what that looked like. And then, Scholz bypassed the sun and flew somewhere further to surf space. You weren't expecting some kind of disaster, were you? If it had happened, you wouldn't have had a chance to watch this video right now. But from this story, we can see what happens to the Earth during such stellar events. At that time, a huge amount of volcanic activity unfolded on our planet. We also got some meteor showers that almost wiped us out. Our ancestors sure had it rough. Something similar will happen on our hypothetical planet with four suns, but on a much greater scale. Constant volcanic activity, earthquakes, and tsunamis. Brr. In addition, the length of a day will change, as well as the length of all seasons and a year as a whole. They won't be stable anymore due to the regular changes in gravitation. In other words, you'll never know when to expect an annual winter or hot summer. And when we are precisely in the middle between two stars, there won't be any nights at all. They'll illuminate both parts of our planet, and we'll have to sleep in bright sunlight. And if you think this is a bad thing, Keep in mind that we'll also be attacked by much more ultraviolet rays and solar winds because of our four suns. Their color will also change. They'll become red dwarfs, looking distinctly orange-scarlet in the sky. We'll also get many more solar eclipses, except instead of the moon, the sun would be eclipsed by another sun. It would probably just get a little darker. To be honest, it's unlikely that anything would survive on Earth after all this. I mean, it is possible, but please run a hundred simulations yourself if you want to make sure. But theoretically, we could survive in a simple binary star system. For example, in one that consists of two stars close to each other. Each of them would have to be two times smaller than our Sun. That would be the perfect scenario. And it's quite possible in the future. NASA is currently working on a plan to relocate our descendants to Proxima Centauri b. That's a planet near the closest star system to our Sun, Alpha Centauri. And who knows, maybe one day in the future, we'll really move there. Then we'll see what it's like to live with several suns. What would happen to us and our planet if it became as big as the Sun? The diameter of the Earth is 8,000 miles. Crossing it is like driving back and forth across the USA three times. That doesn't sound like much, right? Well, how about repeating this journey 305 more times? Just imagine the gas expenses. This is the diameter of the Sun, about 865,000 miles. Compared to our Earth, 
The sun is unimaginably huge. So what will happen to us if we catch up with it? There are four possible scenarios, depending on what we mean when we say the size of the sun. Scenario one. The Earth becomes as large as the sun, but its mass remains the same. A colossal planet with the mass of a teeny tiny Earth. First, say bye-bye to gravity. The more massive the planet, the stronger its gravity is, and vice versa. Such a lightweight planet simply wouldn't be able to attract anything to itself. Gravity creates all the heavy substances. Everything, from pebbles to entire continents, is held thanks to it. I believe you've already guessed what would happen without it. We'd all turn into dust particles. Yes, the Earth simply becomes a dust cloud. Oh, and to add fuel to the fire, the gravities of other planets stretch us to the sides, leaving no chance to collect our planet back together again. This scenario doesn't look very good, does it? By the way, even if the Earth somehow remained a planet, life couldn't have originated on it in these conditions. There would have been a considerable distance between the center of the Earth and its surface. And remember, the planet's mass is minimal, so no gravity. It just wouldn't be able to hold the atmosphere. And without the atmosphere, living organisms cannot develop. Not like it would have mattered. The Earth now is a cloud anyway. So now this cloud, weighing about 10 times heavier than Jupiter, is gathering in space. As a result, it collapses and turns into a star. Say hi to the new sun. Scenario two. This works both as a separate scenario and as a result of the previous one. The Earth becomes as large as the sun and gets its mass. Now we have two suns. We become a so-called binary star system. You know what that means. It's time to destroy our entire solar system. Imagine having two centers of mass in one system. The planet's orbits become unstable, perturbed by such a sudden change. Once they get closer to our ex-Earth, they collapse immediately, either from tidal forces or the ex-Earth's impact. Yes, even gas giants. Looking at you, Jupiter. Do you know which one survives and finally gets its revenge on us? Pluto. It would probably be the last remaining X planet in the entire system. It's too far away to notice any changes, except for an increase in the mass of the center of the system. So Pluto's orbit comes closer to our two star system, and that's it. The Earth and the Sun would have to accept that Pluto would be their only friend now. The protoplanetary disk that formed our system billions of years ago doesn't exist anymore. So no more planets can be created in our system. That's all well and good, but what about the Earth itself? What would life be like? Let's see. The nights and days now last longer because of the increase in the Earth's rotation time. There is probably a significant temperature drop in the North and South Poles. Even on our current small planet, they get sunlight scarcely. So if the Earth's size increased, the area of the poles receiving sunlight would decrease even more. On a positive note, there's a lot more space now. No more overpopulation. The planet's size is so huge that it would take you years to get from one point to another. Yeah, if you think about it, we'd probably be very lonely there. But hey, who knows? Maybe rockets would become our primary means of transportation. Yeah, that would have been cool. There are many vast uncharted areas that no human ever saw or visited. We also wouldn't know about the existence of many different civilizations and tribes. Centuries pass and many of us go away without ever meeting other people or learning about them. And that's if we can walk at all. Our bones cannot support our weight with such a considerable gravity and our hearts have to work twice as hard to keep us alive. The birds can't fly anymore. Nothing can, precisely. All the existing trees fall down, and the new ones grow very close to the earth, like grass. Talking about the trees, how is our ecosystem doing? Well, not good. If we don't appreciate the environment on our small earth right now, 
Imagine what would happen if we had such a massive space at our disposal. I even assume that our tons of garbage would have overpowered even those endless supplies of trees and clean water that we would have in our new large home. Our machines and robots have to be huge to do at least something now. That's because even ordinary farms now are the size of the U.S. states. I also assume that it would be much darker than we're used to. The Earth is so small now. Imagine what would happen when our planet becomes the size of the sun itself. Less sunlight means that we'd probably need an artificial sun. Also, the temperature differences on the planet's surface would be huge. If you're surprised, you probably underestimated the size of the sun. It's almost 110 times larger than the Earth. Our new Earth's equator equals our current Earth's 35 equators. Oh, and remember Pluto? Well, it's our only moon now. The first one would have probably crashed into us a long time ago, making us share the fate of the dinosaurs. In that case, all the water would likely evaporate from our planet. Anyway, there are thousands of bad possibilities, but let's just move on and focus on something good. Scenario 3 Same thing, but the Earth retains its density. Now this one is interesting. We're no longer a planet. We're a star now. In fact, we became even more massive than the Sun. Our planet now has a 3.9 solar mass because we need to balance our low density somehow. In short, it would be almost the same as in Scenario 2, but with more interesting long-term consequences. Since our Earth became four times as massive as the Sun, it would have burned its fuel quicker. Then it would evolve, and depending on the mass of its core, it either becomes a supernova or just blows off its outer layers to form a planetary nebula. If it goes supernova, the sun that was so close to us blasts. And now, there is just our ex-Earth, a lonely ball with a teeny tiny diameter of 12.5 miles. We're a neutron star. That is, a star made of degenerate neutron matter. That thing is ultra dense and spins very quickly, so you'd better stay away from it. If the Earth becomes a nebula, the sun collects all the dust and adds it to its mass. Now we have a slightly more massive sun and a white dwarf. The time passes, and Grandpa Sun lives out his life. It becomes a red giant after depleting the hydrogen in its core. It starts expanding and leaves its material, mostly hydrogen, on the white dwarf. That's us. When the matter reaches high enough temperatures and pressures, nuclear fusion happens. We become a nova. Yay, we're a star again. A lonely one, but a star nevertheless. So what happens next? You see, a star is a battle of opposing forces. One of them is gravity, which tries in every possible way to compress the lead into a small ball as much as possible. The second is a pile of fuel in the star's core, which, while burning, forms tons of energy and substantial hot temperatures. As long as these forces are in balance, the star lives. But when the star's fuel runs out, the star cools down. The pressure inside it drops. This means gravity has won. It squeezes the star with all its might. And as a result, the star goes, hooray! In just 15 seconds, the brightest light you've ever seen in your life flashes. And our ex-Earth goes supernova, leaving a stunning nebula behind. Anyway, don't worry. It's actually impossible for a rocky planet to be the size of the sun. Only other stars can be that large. But wait, why is our Earth so small while the other planets are enormous? Do they just keep growing, or do they stop at some point? The more mass you add, the more compression you get. As planets become more massive, the gravitational compression increases. They stop growing when their mass reaches roughly 1.7 times that of Jupiter or 540 masses of the Earth. After that, adding more mass to a planet will make it smaller because the compression becomes stronger. In other words, our little thought experiment is impossible. <laughs>